Comey was spying on Trump. Well, the reason he was writing the memos was to create a record so that he could destroy No them. American knowingly colluded with the Russians to interfere in our election campaign. Oh, wait. Unless you mean Hillary Clinton. Pardons, prosecutions, and transparency. Hi, everyone. Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update here on social media. Thanks for joining us as always this week. The election crisis continues. Attorney General Barr is leaving. We have uh, new smoking gun documents about Biden, Barisma, even Clinton corruption. Plus, we're in a legal battle that's been resolved, I think, in our favor with the former mayor of South Bend, Mayor Buttigieg, who uh, the Biden team is proposing to put him in as transportation secretary uh, if he is ultimately installed as president. Uh, so uh, on top of that, uh, we've got the election crisis that continues. So I'll give you an update on that. And I, I think I'll start with the current crisis or the most significant current crisis, which is uh, the concerns about election integrity. Uh, the fact that we had, according to the evidence I've been able to ascertain, uh, a failed election. And what do I mean by a failed election? I mean, an election that was conducted according to law in the key states, the battleground states we're talking about, that didn't result in, a res, uh, in, in an outcome uh, that frankly doesn't reflect the lawful votes of the state voters in the various battlegrounds. And uh, by that, I mean, you had the states essentially break the law at, at the state level and arguably constitutionally to count ballots that shouldn't have been counted. And it was the counting of those illicit ballot, ballots that led to the certification that uh, uh, Joe Biden is uh, set to be uh, the next president. And that certification obviously occurred through the Electoral College that met this week. But of course, that's not doesn't mean necessarily that it's over. And I know it's been frustrating to see courts refuse to take up and grapple with uh, the lawlessness associated with the election. Uh, in fact, uh, it was curious this week, I noticed there was a challenge to the way the elections for Senate are going to run in Georgia. And I guess the Republicans are concerned, rightly so, that the same mess that led to uh, the controversy over the presidential election outcome and counting and uh, use of mail-in balloting in Georgia, it's all going to happen again in the Senate. So they're in court trying to fix the law. We're trying to get Georgia to follow the law. And uh, and I haven't read the decision, so this, this this may not be actually in the decision, assuming one's out there. But the, one of the, the judges says, well, isn't it too early to talk about voter fraud? Isn't it speculative at this point? So this is, this is the reality of the judiciary. They say it's too early to sue about voting irregularities, election irregularities and misconduct before an election. And then they say after the election, it's too late. So that's the catch 22. Uh, the judges are uh, are using to avoid reckoning uh, with the rule of law. Now, of course, uh, the state legislators, as I've uh, explained to you repeatedly here, have independent authority uh, to appoint electors under our constitutional system. Uh, it's called the Electors Clause. You can look it up. And so you had the Electoral College meet, or the electors for the Electoral Colleges meet, Electoral College met in the various state capitals. So in places like Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, you had also the Republican electors, the electors who committed themselves to voting for Trump, also meet and say they want to vote for Trump. Now, legally speaking, I don't know what the value of those people voting for Trump are in terms of the electors, uh, but it does provide an alternative slate, practically speaking, because this is a policy debate now. This is a political debate by and large. This is a decision whether the state legislators want to continue to bless, as I call it, these uh, compromised elections, these failed elections in their states, 
and as importantly, whether Congress wants to bless these failed elections in their states. Now, Mitch McConnell has told their senators, his senators, he doesn't want anything, at least reportedly. I don't know what actually happened. I wasn't there. These are leaks. Uh, Mitch McConnell doesn't want a fight on the Electoral College in the Senate. So this, again, is what will happen. And uh, bear with me if you heard me talk about this before, but it's worth repeating. The Electoral College has met. They certified, uh, you know, they voted for President, uh, Vice President Biden to be the next president. Well, that isn't finalized until Congress finalizes it by accept, counting and essentially accepting the votes. So the, under federal law and the Constitution, Congress can object to the votes, and they can do that by having one member of the House and one member of the Senate raise a written objection to certain electors. So for instance, Mo Brooks, who is the congressman from Alabama, who's already committed to objecting, if there's one senator on the other side, if there's one senator who also objects, it means that both the Senate and the House go to their separate ways and debate the issue for two hours. Now in the Senate, it's I think it's a straightforward up or down vote. In the House, it's a little unclear uh, because on the, in the House, uh, under the 12th Amendment, they talk about uh, if there's a dispute with the president and there's no consent, uh, there aren't enough electors one way or another in terms of majority or the number necessary to win, the House votes by delegation. And if that happens, uh, that means Republicans have the majority because they control more delegations than Democrats, even though Democrats have numerically greater numbers of Democrats in the House. So the real interesting question is, if there's an objection, does the House vote by delegation or by majority? Now, I think twice before it's been by majority, which obviously wouldn't turn out well for President Trump. But I don't know if that's right under the Constitution. I don't know if that's right under the Constitution. You know, I've examined the law. I've examined the precedent here. And it's sketchy, to put it mildly. Uh, the law, the law is, is uh, not as clear as it could be. Uh, precedent is, is uh, there's not much precedent. And if there's objections even to how the House handles this, I don't know if the courts would step in, whether Vice President uh, uh, Pence, who would still be vice president, who would manage this whole system, this whole discussion um, in terms of he's the presiding officer when the House and the Senate meet on affirming electoral college votes. So I don't know how that will work. So anyone who tells you, oh, well, this is impossible. This can't be done. The law says this. The Constitution says this. And therefore, Trump has zero chance. That's not true. That's not true. I mean, I've been doing this work at Judicial Watch for going on 23 years now, I think, entering my 23rd year. And uh, one thing I've learned as a, a non-lawyer and as a student of Washington, D.C., and how things work here, is that experts who say one thing uh, with all the certainty in the world usually are not right, in the sense that pretty much everything is debatable. You know, we can point to what the law says, uh, we can point what the facts say, and there's always differing interpretations and the ways in which it's been applied. And I'm not saying, I'm not I'm not just saying, you know, we should just ignore what the law says. I'm not saying it depends in, in, a, uh, in a dishonest way, you know, ignore some things when it's convenient for you, promote other things when it's convenient for you, you know, the political process, the political way of approaching things. But here, this is a political process in the Senate and the House. Uh, the law guiding that process is not clear. For instance, it suggests, the federal law suggests that they give deference to uh, the slate certified by the executive of the state. Well, A, there's a different interpretation as to what the executive of the state would be. And then B, there's a constitutional issue with that because of the primacy the, court, the, the Constitution gives the legislators, state legislatures, in selecting the electors. So I don't know how that's going to turn out. So I, my point is that if we have one senator and one member of the House object to slates from states whose elections 
uh, there are concerns about, which as I said, are substantial and legitimate in my view. I don't know how it's gonna turn out. It's likely to turn out that President Trump will lose. It's likely. It's not certain. It's not certain. And as far as I'm concerned, if the object if objections are lodged, all bets are off. It's all bets are off. I mean, the inertia and the train is going down uh, for uh, and with um, uh, Vice President Joe Biden to finally be president elect as a result of congressional action. Uh, but this is why the left and this is why the establishment doesn't want objections in the House and the Senate because they're not confident, though, Biden can certainly pull it off. They're not they're not certain that Biden has a lock. So they want no debate. They want no objectors. And uh, uh, I don't know why Mitch McConnell, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's correct that Mitch McConnell doesn't want this to go on. It's certainly um, based on my, uh, my observing McConnell over the years. It's certainly consistent with his approach on uh, on on these types of matters. But the question you should be asking your senators, the question you should be asking your state legislators, because there's still time for them to act. The question you should be asking your congressmen is where are they going to stand on these compromised elections? Where do they stand? And it's important you share your views. I know it's the holiday. I know it's Christmas. But they're working. The Senate's working now. Call them. 202-224-3121. Call your senators. Ask them what they think. Are they going to stand up and share your views? They want to hear them. Someone, we were, I was talking about this with someone else the other day, and they say, and we were talking about why hasn't one senator, one senator come forward to enforce, uh, to say, I'm, I'm not going to buy into this. I'm not going to be a rubber stamp for elections that are quite obviously compromised. And someone and the response was, and it's a truism, if they don't if they don't see the light, make them feel the heat. Make them feel the heat. That means communicating with your elected representatives to let them know what you think. So I um, I encourage you to do so. Uh, anyone who tells you it can't work that way or no way, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, it's an attack on democracy, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. And by the way, the left was planning to do this too. As I explained, they were threatening, um, uh, they did a war game scenario uh, where they would have states threaten to secede from the union in order to get their electoral college slate seated um, uh, in favor of Joe Biden. So they were thinking civil war to remove President Trump from office. But uh, those of us concerned about the, the rule of law, and this isn't because of any personal support uh, that um, I have or anyone else has for or against President Trump or for or against Joe Biden. You know, my view is if you break the rules, you, we got to have a way of accountability enforcing the rule of law here. And it looks to me like they broke the rules in these states. We knew this was coming. We warned you this was coming down the track. They were going to change the rules in a way uh, to undermine confidence in the fair administration of the elections. And by gosh, they did it. And the problem is they broke state law in a way that unfortunately the courts don't want to grapple with, but the legislatures can and Congress can still. So the rumor mill is that Tommy Tuberville, who is the incoming senator in Alabama, he's willing to consider this uh, issue of objecting uh, to electors. Uh, senator Ron uh, Johnson, the senator from Wisconsin, whose state was severely compromised, uh, his election, the election results there were severely compromised by voting ballots, that, by counting ballots illicitly. Uh, counting, even worse, it's counting illicit ballots illicitly. Gathering them contrary to law and then counting them contrary to law. Uh, and then, of course, you have Senator Rand Paul, and then you've got other stalwarts like Ted Cruz and Senator Lee, who might also uh, jump in. But they haven't, none of them have said anything that they're going to do it. They're all thinking about it. And the courts, uh, best I can tell, even though there are legitimate claims, the courts are either slow rolling the claims to make it 
to kind of moot out the claims or just avoiding dealing with um, for political purposes, uh, just just refusing to deal with the reality that President Trump has claims and and uh, under law uh, should should have had those slates in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia, et cetera. Uh, he should have been the beneficiary of those slates. He should have been the one getting those electors. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know what needs to be done if we want the rule of law to prevail, which is that the Senate and the Congress need to, uh, then the House, uh, need to take this seriously. Ron Johnson had a hearing the other day uh, raising issues, uh, highlighting some of the issues. Good for him. And it's still not too late to do additional hearings and such. You should be asking your members of Congress, where are you? Where is the leadership? Why is Ron Johnson doing this virtually alone? He and Rand Paul. This is a crisis. Now, separately, the other rule of law crisis is the Joe Biden corruption scandal. And it ties into Attorney General Barr's resignation, which was announced on Monday. Now, as you know, uh, Attorney General Barr, or at least the Justice Department under Attorney General Barr, has been a black hole in terms of transparency for Judicial Watch. They've been objecting to us. They've been uh, objecting to our ability to get documents. Uh, right now, the, just recently, they went into court to shut down all of our Clinton email investigations and discovery and FOIA lawsuits. They don't want us to do anything. They've been protecting Hillary Clinton. They've been protecting Barack Obama. They've been protecting Joe Biden. They've been protecting the deep state. And I know Durham is supposedly doing an investigation. As I said, I'm not seeing any evidence. He did a serious investigation. We'll see. Maybe he'll, he'll come out with a report. Uh, but that in a quarter will get you a cup of coffee, right? And uh, we had Barr intervening to stop the Justice Department from doing anything on Joe Biden before the election. Given the information that's been out there in terms of documentary evidence, remember, they had these laptops. I mean, the Hunter Biden laptop since December of last year, a year ago, and nothing's been done. So what do I think about Attorney General Barr? I think it's, it's just a fail, just another failure in terms of the tenure. And this is not a matter of, and I recognize the policy changes he made that many other conservatives support and I would support personally. I mean, that's a different issue. I mean, that you, but you could have any Attorney General do that, which is change the policies of the Justice Department in a more conservative direction. But on election integrity, a wall. They did nothing, and I'm not talking about investigating election fraud after the election. That's another whole other. Well, uh, that's a whole other kettle of fish. I'm talking about doing what was necessary to ensure, for instance, the rolls were clean prior to the election. They didn't do any of that. There was one case they were involved in. The Judicial Watch had actually uh, uh, plowed in the, the initial ground on, which, which was in Kentucky, and the Justice Department came in and said, well, essentially, Judicial Watch is right. You need to get a consent decree. And when the Justice Department says you need to get a consent decree, usually you get a consent decree. But beyond that, they've been AWOL. But on the key issue of our time, which is the illegal monitoring and targeting and the abuse of power of uh, victimizing President Trump and other innocents like General Flynn. A bar hasn't done enough. Because, you know, the, I, I don't know how else to describe it other than you have Vice President Biden about to be president. And there's been no investigation of the rather obvious criminal conduct he's been implicated in. And you can bet if he does become president, there will be none. Judicial Watch will be doing the work, but the Justice Department, they'll be just circling around the issue and nothing will get done. That's, that's what I predict. So, I, you know, Barr is a big disappointment in that regard. Uh, but 
he can still do something. He can appoint, for instance, a special counsel to investigate Joe Biden. I don't like special counsels, but I guess, you know, I've made the argument that special counsels are are uh, dubious. Uh, certainly a special counsel investigating a president is constitutionally suspect. But I've made that argument and it what's good and no one seems to listen. No one seemed to care because Trump was the victim. And the target. So the question is, is Joe Biden going to be held to the same standard President Trump is going to be held? Frankly, they should be doing an immediate investigation now. It's after the election, right? One of the big lies that we've heard in defending Barr's conduct is that, well, the Justice Department's not supposed to take any overt acts before the election. That's not what the rule is. The rule is the Justice Department's not supposed to do anything because of the election. So it means it can't say, oh, we got to go after this person because there's an election coming up and we want to have an impact on the election. Well, the inverse of that is, oh, well, this person's running for office and they're running for election. So therefore, they get a, get a jail free card and they don't have to answer any questions. Not only do they not have to answer any questions, but their son doesn't have to answer any questions. And by the way, because we don't know how long, you know, this election, they're, they're, they're thinking about running for presidency. Um, uh, years ahead of time. So we'll go back two years and we won't do anything because we don't want to get involved in politics. Isn't that convenient? So I fundamentally disagree with that approach. And the rule was explicitly violated by the Obama Justice Department where they violated any sense of any sense of ethics by specifically targeting Trump because he run, was running for office and because he was a threat. They protected Joe Biden and interfered in the election by doing nothing about it. The Justice Department, again, interfered in our election by doing nothing about the Joe Biden scandals. So, uh, Now, Mr. Rosen, who is the acting attorney general, you know, he was running the Justice Department on a day to day basis the last uh, two years. I don't expect much from him. Maybe maybe now that he's in the big chair, he'll do something big. I don't know. Maybe because he was only number two, he deferred to Attorney General Barr in some of these decisions and maybe he'll be more aggressive. But, you know, I, I kind of look at uh, uh, I often use this, I often observe that uh, if you listen to the radio, you hear uh, oftentimes ads for market, uh, for investment opportunities, invest in gold, invest in this, invest in that. And always at the end of the commercial, they say quickly, the announcer, uh, past, uh, past results is no indication of future performance. I say it quickly, right? Because that's the warning. For, and it's a good warning for investment. Just because they did well in the past doesn't mean they'll do well in the future. But in matters of politics, it's the exact opposite. Past performance is a good indication of future performance. So what we've seen in the Justice Department, we can expect more of. I mean, for instance, the Justice Department and the FBI just told Judicial Watch, oh, COVID again, COVID again. We can't give you struck page email communications that we've already been slow walking we're going to have to slow walk them more slow walk them more and cut back the monthly productions in half they can only review 500 pages now they can only review up to 250. at this rate we'll be getting them in 2028 say that sarcastically, but I, I don't, I'm afraid I'm not as far off as, uh, <laughs> as I'd like to be. You may have seen the news this week about new texts that were coming out between from Peter Strzok and, or Lisa Page showing they were targeting Trump even before they opened Crossfire Hurricane, showing that they knew that Steele was a leaker, their source, but they still tried to use him. And that he was trying to impact politics. 
Well, that material, as I said, we we sued for three years ago, and now it's only being leaked a month after the election or released. Ray's FBI, in terms of transparency, is corrupt to the core. They've had this stuff, and they don't want to give it to Judicial Watch. And we've been complaining about it in the courts elsewhere, and Attorney General Barr did nothing about it. Ray's FBI did nothing about it. So, you know, in, in the work we do, Barr's been a failure. He's been a failure. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate other policies that he uh, implica- implemented at the Justice Department change in policies. But uh, on the core issue of whether we would allow uh, a criminal, seditious conspiracy against uh, our republic, try to put an innocent man like General Flynn in jail, zero accountability thus far. So uh, that's that's my uh, that's my point of view on bar. But you know, Judicial Watch is just going to keep on doing the work. <laughs> you know, that's I I, I was uh, I, I make the point. It's in many ways it's been the Holder Lynch Sessions Bar Justice Department. <laughs> Nothing's really changed in terms of transparency from the Obama administration. In fact, it got a little worse. And so if a new Justice Department, it doesn't matter who the next attorney general is, it doesn't matter who appoints them unless President Trump comes in and appoints someone just like President Trump. I don't expect any difference in January. I just don't. I just don't. So we just have to keep on doing the work we're doing because we can't trust them to investigate Biden. So we'll do it. We'll do it for you. We've done it before. We'll do it again. And along those lines, we just had an astonishing email come out that uh, I I think it was from the State Department. Yeah, the State Department. I'll read you the press headline. New Obama State Department email show Ukraine prosecutor general was pitched high level access to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. So here we've got this is a really follow this. In this email, we've got Clinton, Burisma, and Ukraine all in one. And this is in 2016. We had 38 pages of records, and the big record was we had sued for records. And this is, again, inexcusable because this is material we had asked for. uh, Yeah, we sued last year for this. Now, Ambassador Yovanovitch was um, alleged to have given an untouchables list that included people close to the Biden gang. Meaning they were protected. And Yovanovitch was the Obama ambassador to Ukraine for the United States, held over and reappointed by President Trump. And then she turned into an anti-Trump witness during the impeachment coup attack on the president. We seek for all records of communications between the Department of State and any representative of the Ukrainian government regarding any actual or proposed investigation or prosecution of the ANTAC, the International Renaissance Foundation, which is part of the Soros Network, and or Transparency International, another left-wing group. All records concerning any meeting or telephonic conversation between former Ambassador Yovanovitch and former Attorney General, excuse me, Ukrainian Prosecutor General, Yuri Lutsensko, and all records related to the list of individuals and entities provided by Lutsensko by Yovanovitch in late 2016. So Lutsensko says, I got a list, either orally or written. I got a list from Lutsensko, from Yovanovitch, to stay away from these people, these connected Obamaites. And now the records include a September 2000. Now we sued for the records and they finally gave us an email, a t- September 3rd, 2016 email from uh, George Kent. Now, who is George Kent? Kent was, um, he's now, he was then the United States Deputy Chief of Mission to Ukraine. And now he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Eurasian Affairs. So he was a top official for the State Department in Ukraine at the time, and now he's a top official generally for us in matters of Europe. 
And the email reads as follows in part. The email subject line is, Lutsensko now likely not to go to DC with Blue Star, other Ukraine issue comments, which says, Lutsensko confirmed he had been pitched by Blue Star. Blue Star Strategies, by the way, was a left-leaning Democratic lobbying firm hired by Burisma. Hunter Biden was on the board of Burisma. So this is a Hunter Biden Burisma lobbying firm. And they're connected to the Clinton administration. Its chairman had worked for um, uh, John Podesta in the Clinton and White House. And, and if it Hillary had won at the time, he was likely to be chief of staff again. Lusensko confirmed he had been pitched by Blue Star, not sought them out, which is okay. So he, they came for him and he didn't ask them for any help. He said he honestly didn't know how Blue Star was to get paid. He didn't have funds. So they were going to give him free money, free services, which is interesting, isn't it? And that some BPP MP, which is a, another party in parliament in Ukraine, uh, that we probably didn't know, and that's good, had, uh, and there's some redacted information, had introduced them to him. So there were these folks in the Ukrainian politics that introduced him. Blue Star CEO, Tramotano, uh, uh, her pitch was that she could give him access to high levels of Clinton campaign and GPK note, this is in the email, she was Podesta's deputy as deputy chief of staff for the last year of Bill Clinton's tenure. And that was appealing. Okay, so to be clear, the pitch was she could gain him access to high levels of the Clinton campaign. And that was appealing to meet with the possible next presidential chief of staff, namely Podesta. Later in the same email, Kent added that he suggested that Lusenko not take the offer. Kent was doing everything he could to keep Burisma at, in, a, in a box because he knew the corruption involved. I shouldn't say he was doing everything he could, but it's pretty clear in the email traffic here and elsewhere we reviewed, they all knew Burisma was bad news. Kent added that he suggested that Lusenko not take that offer because Blue Star represented Burisma. Kent also mentioned corruption concerns related to the Clinton Foundation and Podesta. So it's even worse. So you've got the top prosecutor in Ukraine getting, it looks like an offer of free help from Burisma's lobbying firm. Burisma, of course, the board, two people close to Biden, Hunter and Devin Archer are on the board getting gobs of money, despite having no expertise either in Ukraine or the issues for which they were being asked to allegedly work on. And the prosecutor that could put Burisma in jail is getting free <laughs> lobbying and help to contact and deal with potentially the incoming president. Kent knew what was going on. This Obama State Department official knew what was going on, and she, he warned you, Yovanovitch. In connection to Blue Star, I noted their representation of Burisma Solovetsky mentioned the very, well, Solovetsky, I think, was the uh, chairman of Blue Star, of, of, of Burisma, I think, mentioned the various money flows from Ukraine to lobbyists that have been prominently in the news this past month, whether Manafort, via Brussels to Podesta Group. So he's got the Trump campaign manager at the time, and he ties it to Podesta, of course, is in Clinton world. Another uh, an another Ukraine official uh, to Skadden Arps and Greg Craig, Greg Craig, a Democratic lawyer. I think he was charged with some misconduct there. I, I got acquitted, believe it or not. And then Pinchuk, who was, I think, a Ukrainian oligarch, going on memory. It's scary that I even recognize the name. Uh, he gave a bunch of money to the Clinton Foundation. And Kent talks about the media attention being paid at the time to the Kiev-Washington gravy train. The gravy train, he called it. 
and Burisma's in the center of it. And he says, and he got the drift. Not ideal timing, little receptive audience and wrong facilitator. Well, that was a good analysis, right? Bad timing. No one wants to talk to you people and you pick the wrong and you'll be picking the wrong facilitator. And Lushenko said, he said he'd figure out a better time when there would be more traction and better audience. And as we know, note, the email is inconsistent with Yovanovitch's October 2019 impeachment testimony that she knew little, very little about Burisma Holdings and said it wasn't just, it wasn't a big deal. Well, this is now, I think, the third or fourth email where Burisma is put specifically on her radar screen. And again, it further confirms that President Trump was righter than right to raise questions about Ukraine and the Bidens. So this smoking gun email is not the result of a Justice Department investigation. It's not the result of a congressional investigation. It's not the result of a media investigation. It's the result of a Judicial Watch investigation. It shows the Obama administration knew full well that Burisma and uh, its lobbying firm connected to Hunter Biden was influence peddling in Ukraine and in Washington and had connected it all to the Clinton campaign. And not only that, but the Obama State Department knew about shady dealings, it looks like, between Ukrainian officials and, and Eastern Europeans, Russia, Ukraine, you name it, and the Clinton Foundation. And so that's why I get upset when I hear everyone say, oh, uh, when I hear the left media and, and defenders of uh, a somnolescent Justice Department defend their lack of action here. It's indefensible. These are not secret documents. This wasn't hidden in Ukraine. This is in the State Department's files. The Justice Department had this. The State Department had this. Remember, while the president was being impeached for raising questions about Biden corruption, everyone said, well, those were all baloney questions. They had Hunter laptops, Hunter Biden's laptop that proved the president was righter than right. So forgive me for getting a little outraged that the Justice Department purposely slow walking and hiding and covering up corruption as this president is torn apart for asking questions about the corruption. They all knew he was right, and they, through sins of omission, made it seem like he was wrong, and he was right. So we've got more documents coming. Uh, we, uh, you know, we've been getting documents uh, more or less out of the State Department. They're slow walking the information, and it will continue. If Biden comes in, it will continue under the Biden administration. I mean, I can't tell you that at this point that we're going to get anything different. Now, we'll have more lawsuits, I suspect, about this Burisma issue. I know we're looking at additional Freedom of Information Act requests, which are still being denied, which are still being stonewalled by the State Department and Justice Department, et cetera. So more is coming. More is coming. So next up is Peter Buttigieg, who Joe Biden wants to appoint as a transportation secretary. He ran for president, and um, his previous big experience is obviously running for president, but also before that, he was mayor of South Bend, Indiana. And Judicial Watch investigated a program that it looks, a shady program it looks like, that uh, allowed illegal aliens in South Bend to get voter, uh, not voter IDs, but IDs to make it easier to reside and live in the United States contrary to law. And the way they did that was they used a third party, a nonprofit, but it looks like the city was involved in setting it up. So. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They want this nonprofit to achieve this result uh, on behalf of the city government. And it's pretty clear the mayor was involved and supporter, supportive of this. He's no longer mayor. So we had done, we had, we did what we normally do, which is we use the Freedom of Information Act, the Indiana version of the law, to ask for the records. And we, I think we sued about this last year. And it was a simple request, give us records 
about um, uh, his communications about this program to uh, provide essentially sanctuary benefits for illegal aliens, giving them an ID card. And so Judicial Watch sued. We thought we'd get the records. Instead, we got the runaround. And uh, the mayor, it looked like, had been conducting business on his um, personal email account, which is, I understand, happens time to time, but if they even want to look for, for emails there. And we'd asked for the records. We didn't get any records from the mayor. We said, well, did he do anything? You know, did he, what did he write records elsewhere in, in a private way on his email, on his private email system? And it looks like that was the case. And we were asking for his deposition to find out what was going on. So you can imagine what they thought of that. So we got into a big fight about that. So to resolve the issue, the mayor, uh, excuse me, Mayor uh, Pete Buttigieg, agreed to search his personal emails. So we just got his personal, uh, the results of that search uh, just the other day. I haven't reviewed it carefully. Uh, but it does confirm, in the least, he was using his personal emails to conduct government business. And so uh, this kind of shows you a few things. That uh, this politician uh, didn't want anyone to know about his involvement in this plan to give IDs through a private entity to illegal aliens, a sanctuary policy. And certainly isn't it curious that the mayor and the city of, of, of South Bend fought us for so long on this? I mean, we've got to expend resources to litigate this. It's in a state different from Judicial Watch, so it's, it's not as easy as it is to do here in Washington, D.C., where we file many of our lawsuits. And, of course, the taxpayers of Indiana and South Bend are, are spending money Objecting to law, you know, defending lawlessness. But just give us the documents. So uh, we'll see what's in the emails. We'll look at it carefully and then decide what to do from there. But uh, now he's up there for transportation secretary. So I think it's interesting. I think it will be part of the discussion that he was uh, using his office to help protect the legal aliens by giving them ID cards. Now you know more about people to judge and the media won't tell you about it, but Judicial Watch will. So isn't that interesting? So uh, uh, this is what I love about Judicial Watch is these things that, uh, you know, they, everyone else finds it inconvenient and too hard to do the work, but we do the work. I mean, the media pretends that they do journalism. They don't do journalism. The media does, and I, and I say that with some exaggeration. The media sometimes says journalism. I mean, I, that obviously is true. But much of what passes for media discussion about political figures like Pete Buttigieg is gossip. It's gossip. They're giving them, if people are talking to the reporters about who's up and who's down and what Pete Buttigieg will bring to the position and uh, how other appointees, what they will bring to the position uh, that they're being appointed. And this happens for Republicans and Democrats. But what they actually did, they're not interested in that. Now, the media has been doing a little bit more investigating into some of these, you know, Biden uh, folks that Biden wants to appoint. He wants to bring Susan Rice back into uh, the White House. Susan Rice, who lied five times about Benghazi, the terrorist attack that led to the murders of four Americans. They lied about that. And she's going to be rewarded. And she was also involved in the Illegal, or I should say illicit, I guess I could say illegal, targeting of President Trump and General Flynn and the cover-up thereof. So that's why I get upset about what this Justice Department has done, because these folks hadn't been held accountable. They have not been held accountable, and now they're back. Now they're, they want to come back. The corrupt Obama, Biden, Clinton gang... They're all coming back. Do you think they're going to just be ethical politicians and officials now? Why would they?
they got away with it more or less from their perspective, right? But for Judicial Watch, Hillary Clinton would have been president. But for Judicial Watch, Mueller would probably still be walking around investigating Trump. But for Judicial Watch, I don't think Trump would be in the presidency, meaning he would have been removed. By the uh, you know the deep state Mueller operation, working with Adam Schiff, et cetera. So once again, no matter what happens in January, it's going to be up to Judicial Watch. And by up to Judicial Watch, I mean also up to you. I encourage you to support our work. I encourage you to remain active on these issues of government corruption. I mean, we'll be doing it all, monitoring the Biden administration, monitoring the Trump administration. Doesn't matter who. We'll be fighting for clean elections. It doesn't matter what happens in January. We'll be fighting to maintain the rule of law on immigration. It doesn't matter what happens in January. And of course, getting accountability and the truth about the worst corruption scandal in American history, which is spying on Americans to keep themselves in power. That's what the Obama gang did. And we're not going to give up on it. So with that, I wish you uh, a Merry Christmas. I I should be back next week, maybe with a special Christmas message. But if I'm not, I extend on behalf of my family here and my colleagues at Judicial Watch to you and yours, a wonderful and Merry Christmas and uh, Happy Hanukkah. I don't know if we're still in the middle of Hanukkah, but I uh, wish you all the best during this Christmas and holiday season. And God bless you and yours, and I'll see you next time here on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update.